Dave from Hey You Guys at Coda UK where today we're going to get an exclusive look around Pixar Studios. We'll get to see a bit more about Toy Story 3, what we can expect coming up over the next summer. And uh, yeah, I hope you enjoy it. Check this out. Andy's going to college. Can you believe it? What are you going to do with these old toys? Okay, calm down, guys. Let's just keep this in perspective. Where is she taking us? I should have seen this coming. We'll be fine, Jesse. Oh, I hate all this uncertainty. <laughs> New toys. Yeah! Buzz Lightyear, at your service. Welcome to Sunnyside, folks. You'll find being donated was the best thing that ever happened to you. Oh, may I? Ooh. <laughs> the doctor said previously during making up that 3D wasn't maybe originally part of the plan or maybe, you know, in the early planning stages. Is this the first movie where 3D was part of the plan since the inception? Or did you did you come in, again, partially through um, the, working through the film? Um, well, we always knew it would be in 3D. And so it was a question of how do we want to integrate it into the process? And to a large extent, we arrived somewhat similar to what we did on Up, where let's let the artists make their movie without constraints or changing things for the 3D. Um, but on TS3, we did a, quite a few more subtle reframings for the 3D version. We changed the depth of field in a number of shots because uh, foreground objects that are deeply out of focus can be jarring in 3D. They, they draw your eye to them instead of the intent, which is to push your eye back to where it should be directed. Um, we've gone through and we've culled out foreground objects that um, would be too far out in audience space. Um, to be comfortable and still let us have our characters in screen. Um, so there are dozens and dozens of shots in Toy Story 3 that are changed for the 3D version. Um, but it wasn't a film where we manufactured story moments for 3D. You know, we didn't conceive of an action sequence where characters would, would spin or fly through the air to take advantage of 3D, those types of things. Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't really conceived solely for 3D. 3D was, was kind of part of the package of the film. Uh, Pixar, is 3D always going to be a window, or is there ever, ever going to be um, something that pops out? I know that that's sometimes distracting, but is there ever a time when you feel that you need to pop out, and why? Yeah, um, absolutely. And you know, we use a technique that it's called floating windows or stereo windows. Have you heard of that? Mm -hmm. um, what that is is a black bar on the right side of frame in your right eye or on the left side in your left eye, what it does is it cheats your perception of where the screen is forward. So if we went down and watched some of our stuff and I was trying to laser pointer at the screen so you knew where the screen was, you would see that the characters are, virtually in every shot, there's stuff in front of the screen. It's just that it's tucked behind this kind of cheated wall often, so it feels like everything's recessed. Um, and there are moments more to your specific point where uh, you know characters will reach forward. Um, there are a number of shots in Toy Story 3, you may remember, where the blocking kind of throws characters at camera. Like when the bulldozers push the characters up and the dump, they definitely you know, come out into audience space. Um, I think it's just our goal not to have it, as you surmised, be a, be a way to pop you out of the film. In fact, there's one moment that I'm still kind of figuring out at the end where when the characters are sliding down in the incinerator, yeah. and Buzz reaches his hand out to Woody, like all we can do is hold hands, you know, this is it. And, uh, and so I'm trying to judge now, how far out should that hand come? And if it comes too far out, you go, oh, it's, yeah. Yeah, it's over your head. But it's such an amazing moment, you know, such a story uh, point that, uh, you know, so I'm just, those are the kind of things that I try to make good judgments on. Enough so it feels dimensional and real, but not so much that it would detract from the emotion or point of the moment. Um, you'd be surprised at how much is in front of screen, though. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think even the directors, you know, they don't really know that when I'm putting, I'm trying to put like characters at screen or point of interest at screen, so the head and shoulder of a shot will be pretty far out in the audience and just hid behind a floating window. And so that the person behind the over the shoulder shot um, will be at screen. So there's a lot coming off. It's just not really perceived that. Do you think there's a place in film generally for 2D, or do you think in 10, 15 years, 20 years now, from now, all films will be in 3D? Um, there's definitely a place for 2D. There's, there's no doubt about that. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm a 
fan, I'm an advocate. And so I do think that dramas, romantic comedies, other films can be um, helped by 3D. So I can see it spreading out if it's done wisely, you know, if it's done smartly. I know there's a lot of ideas about TV, televised sports, and concerts and so forth being in 3D. Um, I just, I think that those dramas are probably going to be the last bastion of, do we really need to see the latest television show in 3D or, or comedic show? And, and I don't know. Um, I think the benefits grow smaller and smaller depending on the, the type of story um, and the world that's created. CG is so perfect for 3D, you know, because, uh, well, one thing, our computers, our cameras are computers, essentially. So they, they, they're exactly the same if we do our job right, except for the, for the separation we intend. Now, live action cameras have all kinds of reflection differences or lens length differences, and so your left and right eye views aren't exactly the same. But ours are pixel perfect between the two eyes. And so the CG world is perfect for it. I think, you know, action movies, you know, really lend themselves to it. Um, and it kind of remains to be seen if people can wisely do it for, for all genres. What's the biggest difference in um, being involved in, in a movie from, from day one, like Toy Story 3, or going back to, to older movies like Toy Story 1 and 2, and, uh, all right, let's make this 3D. Is, is it harder or does it give you more uh, freedom to, you know, take yeah. the films and do something with them? Um, it's a really good question. And it, and it can be very similar if the library, as we call it, library title that you're doing, you're able to interact with the director and he's open to changes. Um, for Toy Story and Toy Story 2 that we did, we didn't want to change them. They're such beautiful classic movies that we really didn't change them very much at all. Ratatouille is one that we're exploring and doing, and Brad Bird is very open to um, some changes, you know, some very subtle changes, with slight reframings. If a character is reaching forward and the pinky goes off screen, we'll just adjust the camera or the character a little bit to have the, the hand on. Um, so that said, if the director's open to make, you know, minor modifications on a library title, then, um, then that's wonderful, and we're really excited about doing that. But you saw Night and Day, this wonderful short by Teddy Newton that's so amazing in stereo. You saw the Flat Rex teaser yeah. that we had that's really fun. So, you know, the big leap will be when we have a director who's uh, really interested in, in using a lot of 3D to help tell their story um, and, and do it fairly aggressively. So that, that will be where it truly breaks away from library titles. Um, because as I, as I described, the, the changes that we've made to Toy Story 3 are really rather subtle, all things considered. Um, so that will, that's going to be interesting to see if we have a director come along who really feels like it's a it's an addition to the art form that they want to explore to the fullest. But what would be the difference between uh, a, a, a film that really utilizes 3D in a good way and corny 3D gags like you know like in the, in the Muppet uh, ride in Disneyland sure. where they throw things at the audience? I think one thing that that strikes me is um, editorial choices that in 3D the shots are so beautiful sometimes and so engrossing that you want the shots to last longer. And so it's both a, a comfort of viewing issue where when you have quick cuts in 3D, I just kind of take the 3D out of those shots, frankly, because you're not gonna fuse it anyway, you know, fuse the left and right eye images. Um, so you might make choices much like they have done in, in good 3D movies where the cuts are longer. You just have longer shots and you live in that world and it's more emblematic of what we see in real life than the editorial pace of of a, a lot of quick cuts. So that's a choice you might make. Um, I thought what Day and Night was so cool about, uh, what was so cool about it is that no one really had thought of that idea of, you know, matted out characters in a world behind them. So when you say, you know, what would a director do? Let's find out, you know? Um, I'm, I do 3D all the time, but Teddy's a genius, you know? And so I think he came up with such a cool concept. So. Um, if we really brainstormed and kicked around, we could come up with all kinds of really interesting ideas, I think, to use 3D. One, one thing I'm intrigued by is dissolves and, and uh, just different depths of dissolves and how you can make a really interesting layered piece with characters in foreground, midground, and background and um, use that to help tell the story. Um, so there's a, there's a wide variety of things I think that we can do and have yet to be discovered.